Yeah. Well, it's called the right to freedom. So I we just came out of this yeah. book. It's actually about this book, the right to freedom, which I had very much literally only just got published in last week. It sounds like yeah. an interesting project. I don't know if I get angry. I don't think I'd be already ignoring it. He's trying to do critical um, theory by normative construction, which is looking. Okay, thanks for coming to the third of our clash courses on post-structuralism. Dr. Timothy Secret will be talking about Lacan, and this lecture should be recorded and should be on YouTube for anyone that wants to watch it later on. So I've already made a slight announcement, but let me begin by telling you and our wonderful viewing public that uh, I'm neither dying nor turning into a lobster, I'm just rather badly sunburned. Um, so perhaps the opening lesson of this seminar should be that whatever level of academic achievement you achieve, you'll never stop acting like an idiot. Uh, in the Lacanian terms, the non duped heir. So, the task I'll be failing to live up to today is to try to offer philosophy students something from Lacan, despite assuming that you're all undergraduates, which I know is not entirely true, um, and you're not only unfamiliar with Lacan, but you're unfamiliar with psychoanalysis and Freud, you're unfamiliar with structuralism, Saussure and Levi-Strauss, and you're broadly unfamiliar with the most relevant philosophers, so that's Hegel, Kant, and Heidegger. Um, of course, that probably doesn't apply to any of you. Um, many of you I've taught Lacan to, so I know it doesn't, but beyond that, a lot of you will have at the very least been exposed to Slavoj Žižek telling you about Lacan at some point through the airwaves. So I'm sure most of you have some familiarity, um, but I'm assuming that you don't. I'm assuming that you don't. So the tempting option, given that pretty difficult brief, uh, would be to show you something local, readily applicable, and cool, um, like how Lacan made us rethink ideology, or to offer a Lacanian reading of some particular cultural product. But I've decided to take a bit of a risk. I'm going to try to do something more formal, more fundamental. Um, and in doing this, I'm going to admit up front that I'm going to commit a certain degree of simplification. Uh, it would be impossible to say something interesting in the short time I have while respecting every nuanced distinction between terms like the symbolic phallus, the master signifier, the name of the father, etc. Lacan loves terminology, so I'm just going to try to avoid saying anything false and nevertheless say something interesting in the time I have. So, let's begin. On the 18th of June, uh, 1958, at the St. Anne Hospital in Paris, in a session of his annual seminar that was entitled that year, The Formations of the Unconscious, the famous French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan made the following enigmatic remark. Experience shows us the indispensability of the background provided by the other with respect to the other, without which the universe of language could not articulate itself. The seminar has not yet been officially published in English, but in the French edition of this seminar, um, Lacan's editor and son-in-law, Jacqueline Miller, entitled this session, L'autre de l'autre, the other of the other. Okay, so we may not know what Lacan actually means by this sentence, and more particularly what the other with respect to the other actually amounts to, or what it does, but whatever the other with regards to the other, the other of the other is, it's in the background, we know that. Uh, it's indispensable, we know that. And it allows the universe of language to articulate itself. So pat yourself on the back, you've already learned something, we're going well. <laughs> However, there's a problem. On the 8th of April and on the 13th of May, 1959, at the St. Anne Hospital in Paris, in the session of his annual seminar that was entitled that year, Desire and Its Interpretations, the famous French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan made the following enigmatic remark. This is the great secret. There is no other of the other. And later, there is no other of the other. No signifier exists which might guarantee the concrete, cons concrete consequences of any manifestation of the signifier. There's no, this is obviously no more readily understandable than the other claims, but it seems clear that what Lacan means by the other of the other, whatever function it ought to perform in some supposed ideal world, it does not exist. And therefore, nothing guarantees the concrete consequences of any manifestation of the signifier, whatever that means. So, although he never acknowledges this fact directly, in less than a year, somewhere between June 58 and April 59, Lacan seems to have changed his position pretty fundamentally, from referring to whatever the other of the other is as indispensable, to referring to it as non-existent. From saying that the universe, of lang the universe of language has a background on which it is articulated, to saying that nothing guarantees the concrete consequences of any manifestation of the signifier. Of course, at the same time, you might say he hadn't changed his theoretical position at all. In both cases, he's saying that the other of the other is indispensable for some important facet of language, uh, its articulation, the dependability of its concrete consequences. What changes is not the other of the other's importance, 
but the existential fact of whether it actually exists. So you may think to yourself at this point, who gives a damn? Before I get to why I think you should give a damn, let's jump ahead a few years to something else that you equally might not give a damn about. So, on the 13th of March, 1973, at the Faculty of Law of the Pantheon, uh, in, in an annual se session of his, an of his annual, no, in a weekly session of his annual seminar, which is entitled that year, Encore, standardly subtitled On Feminine Sexuality, the Limits of Love mm -hmm. and Knowledge, the famous French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan began his lecture with the following enigmatic diagram, already on the blackboard behind him. He began his lecture by saying in typical Lacanian fashion that looking at this diagram, you might think you understand everything. <laughs> Don't. Uh, in actual fact, I doubt many people who look at that diagram, even those who've been attending Lacan seminars for 20 years, looked at this and thought they understood everything. But still, on the left-hand side, uh, we have masculine sexuality. And on the right-hand side, we have feminine sexuality. And the top formulas are known as the uh, formulas of sexuation. Uh, and Lacan will say with regards to them that uh, every speaking being, and as adults, humans, that's what you are, you're speaking beings, unlike animals, unlike very small babies that you used to be, every speaking being is situated on one side or the other. And that will pan out in terms of this breakdown of these, these formulas. Um, so what they actually represent with regards to the distinction between masculine and feminine sexuality and the relation of those sexualities to the phallic function is not something I want to go into today at all. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, what I give a damn about today is their pure logical form. So the logical form of these statements, if you translate them from there to there, would be um, the first statement. You can see that you know, there's two statements of existential and there's two statements that are universal, mostly applicable. Um, and the lines over the top of them say not to represent negation. So what these would translate as is um, there exists an X which is not P. Uh, all X's are P. And what this side will translate as is there does not exist an X which is not P and not all X's are P. So that would be the logical formula of it. And you can hopefully see, if you think about those, that that seems pretty wacky and paradoxical because surely that goes with that, and that goes with that. That is to say, um, if I was to tell you that there exists an X that is not P, you'd assume that, that means not all X's are P. And if I was to tell you that there does not exist an X that is not P, you'd assume that that would fit with all X's being P. So you'd assume that this goes with this, and this goes with this. And Lacan seems to do something paradoxical, deliberately confusing, almost logically perverse in saying that actually they fit together in this other way. So that there's a compatibility between there exists an X that's not P and all X's being P. And there does not exist an X that's not P and not all X's are P. It's confusing, it's perverse, it's strange. Um, it doesn't seem to work. Once again, who gives a damn? Why are we even talking about this absurd material? Perhaps you've never heard of Lacan, and after reading these ridiculous sentences, and willfully paradoxical formulas, you're probably quite happy about that. Perhaps you have heard of him, and you've heard he's a charlatan, an intellectual con artist who led a bunch of infatuated and misguided Parisian intellectuals on a merry dance of meaningless babbling and confused science, pseudoscience through the sheer force of his personality. And after reading those sentences and formulas, you might well be increasingly convinced that's true. Perhaps you came today for philosophy, and you're wondering why I'm talking about a psychoanalyst particular psychoanalyst who referred to himself as an anti-philosopher, uh, who when one art once asked by an interviewer about his philosophy, snapped back immediately, I am not a philosopher, a philosopher. I do not make any philosophy. On the contrary, I am wary of it like the plague. <laughs> or perhaps you're already broadly interested in Lacan. Perhaps you've been convinced that despite the renowned difficulty of his works, his writings and speaking style, you suspect it's nevertheless important to have some kind of understanding of him perhaps because his ideas have been so central to well-known philosophers, feminists, art theorists, political theorists, um, <laughs> and such as Alan Badiou, Judith Butler, Lucia Gray, Julia Kristeva, Joan Kopczak, Nesta Leclerc, Slavoj Žižek, or a hundred other figures that I could mention who are very dominant today in all kinds of academic fields. Figures who clearly find something in Lacan, even if it is through reacting against Lacan's anti-philosophy. Perhaps you've even been convinced that 
uh, by uh, Badiou's first manifesto for philosophy, that the anti-philosopher Lacan is the condition of the renaissance of philosophy, and a philosophy is possible today only if it's compossible with Lacan. And perhaps taking that claim seriously, you feel an urge, an obligation even, to work through Lacan to become a post-Lacanian thinker in the conviction that it's only a post-Lacanian thought that can really save academia or save society today. Uh, that to ignore Lacan's work, to be a pre-Lacanian would be equivalent to being a pre-Cartesian or a pre-Kantian or a pre-Hegelian or a pre-Heideggerian. You just can't go backwards, we've got to keep going, we've got to be at the cutting edge, etc. None of this means you agree with all of those thinkers, but at least you feel an urge to understand them and to see how you can go beyond them. Well, even those people, if there's any of you out there, um, will still probably be disappointed that I'm talking to you about some obscure technical difference at stake in two sessions of two seminars that aren't even published in English, or some arcane formulations about sexuality and the phallus from a late seminar that seem to deliberately reject logical order and stand as rather unlikely candidates for being relevant to philosophy, politics, or any other domain. Well, there's a very simple reason why I believe you should give a damn about all of this, and that's because I would like to suggest to you today that if post-structuralism has any meaning as a label, if there was a genuine change that occurred in France during the last century that progressed from structuralism to post-structuralism, then this is the crux of that change. I'm certainly not saying that Lacan's move between 1958 and 1959 is the chronological moment when it happened. Indeed, um, even within Lacan's work, Lorenzo Chiesa, who I'm borrowing a lot here and gives the most sophisticated account of this change in Lacan's position, would argue that there's a far slower development of the kind of overnight abrupt change that I'm depending on here. But what I'm trying to do, putting that subtlety aside, is to suggest that in moving from the basic claim there is an other of the other to the claim there is no other of the other, we have a paradigm of the change. We have a clear and distinct formal example of what it would mean to go from being a structuralist to being a post-structuralist if those words meant anything. Furthermore, the logical form of the formulas of sexuation that the can offer 15 years later, taken at this abstract level rather than as specific claims about sexuality and the phallic function, would be the formal rules that govern the structural and the post-structural. Now, if you don't know this already, and if you can't, you might be able to tell from the fact that I keep on using the word if, that I hate the word post-structuralism. Um, many people today who are working on late 20th century French philosophy or contemporary French philosophy, or what I like to call post-68 French philosophy, uh, avoid the label post-structuralism completely. It's a foreign American invention that serves as an excuse to avoid reading, most of us would say. It functions much in the same way that inventing scholasticism and the mythical figure of the scholastic philosopher, who supposedly spends all day puzzling over how many angels can fit on the head of a pin, allows you to avoid the effort of having to read a millennium and a half's worth of philosophy. You can just skip from ancient Rome to Descartes because, oh, they were just scholastics. Well, the mythical figure of the post-structuralist works in much the same way. Uh, it's a kind of dodge to avoid you having to deal with a bunch of very sophisticated, very diverse, and very difficult texts. It's much easier to just say, oh, they were all post-structuralists. Post -stru that being a post-structuralist means you believe X, Y, and Z, and X, Y, and Z are absurd and stupid, so I don't need to bother reading them. Or alternatively, X, Y, and Z are really cool and edgy, and I'm a post-structuralist, and I've got a beret at home, and I like smoking a pipe, and I'm going to move to Paris when I finish my degree. Um, you know, so those people will just be accepting it all in a blanket sense, not realizing that there's this great diversity going on there. So the point is, it's a stupid label. I expect Steve probably said that already. Um, that Parisian thinkers completely rejected. Uh, Derrida called it a ragbag notion, which is a great word. Um, so to show it's not just me, this is uh, Leslie Hill saying much the same. The largely existent non-theoretical uh, movement sometimes given the meaningless, if not entirely vacuous, name of French post-structuralism, a term never used by Derrida or by any of his French contemporaries, which at its most basic corresponds to a rather dubious desire to gather up under one simplistic and erroneous label a wide range of divergent and sometimes entirely incompatible bodies of work. So that's my general stance. I agree with that. Uh, however, for one day only, um, since this is a post-structuralism masterclass, and I was asked so nicely by John, I'm going to give the label post-structuralism the best shot I can. Um, if it were not a stupid label, if it wasn't stupid, if there was a genuine movement that happened in Paris um, where everyone important changed their mind somewhere around the 1960s and moved from stance X to stance Y, then the best way of understanding X and Y would be via this question of the other of the other. That's my claim. Um, even if in other thinkers that would be expressed in a completely different vocabulary. So the reason we're turning to Lacan, uh, surprisingly, um, you know, a psychoanalyst and anti-philosopher rather than a philosopher, perhaps I could have used Deleuze, I could have used various other people, is simply because Lacan is actually the clearest and the most direct thinker of this change. 
Um, Lacanus is not generally known for his clarity, but in this case, we've got logical formulas, we've got mathematics, you know, it looks very clear. Um, we have a kind of a direct way of uh, approaching it at a formal level what this change is. The only competition on that front would be Badiou, who perhaps offers an even sharper picture of the same issue. And the reason I'm not talking about Badiou is that he only offers that picture in an attempt to kind of move beyond it, to move beyond Lacan, to go back to philosophy from anti-philosophy. So um, I'd also have to talk about maths, which would send most of you to sleep. So I'm not going to talk about Badiou, I'm going to use Lacan for this purpose of showing the difference between structuralism and post-structuralism, if there was a difference, if these labels weren't stupid. Before we turn to that big issue, though, I feel obliged to give a brief orientation in Lacan as quickly as I can. I don't want to take up more than a few minutes, um, since we have some more important things to deal with, but here is Lacan in eight points. Um, so Lacan is a psychoanalyst. Uh, psychoanalysis is a science whose object is the unconscious and whose method of investigation um, cannot be introspective, unlike philosophy. You need two people to do psychoanalysis. Lacan was aiming to return to Freud and the unconscious against the type of work that began with Sigmund Freud's daughter, Anna Freud, and that refocused psychoanalysis on the development of the ego. So Anna's followers said, let's not worry about the unconscious and its dark, mysterious logic and perversions. Let's worry about how a strong, self-guided, logical ego is formed in opposition to the unconscious. And if we can work out how to make one of those grow, then it will defeat the unconscious for us. So we don't need to worry about the unconscious. We need to worry about the development of a strong ego. Lacan thought this was completely misguided. He thought that the stronger you made the ego, the more repressive it came. The more repressive it came, the, the stronger the unconscious became, and the more overwhelmed you'd be. So insofar as you made your ego strong, you actually strengthened your own unconscious, and it led to your own undoing. So Lacan was completely opposed to this. So, and you'd expect then that what Lacan would be doing is trying to say that uh, is trying to talk about the unconscious, trying to move things back to talking about the unconscious that they'd stop talking about. The surprising thing is Lacan doesn't really use the word unconscious very often. Um, Lacan broadly thinks that if you talk about the unconscious, you tend to turn it into this shadowy, mysterious, hidden world, and you end up mystifying it and falsifying it. If you want to understand the unconscious, then we'll do much better as Freud did in his early text by simply investigating its manifestations. So things like slips of the tongue, word associations, dreams, myths, etc. And we study, and to study the unconscious is nothing other than formulating a really rigorous way of describing all of that and all of the processes going on in that. So, this means that a great deal of Lacan's writing is actually about language, it's about meaning, it's about signifiers and signifieds. And that's not because Lacan is not dealing with the unconscious, it's because he is dealing with the unconscious in the best way of talking about the unconscious, which is not to talk about the unconscious. Um, so the key issue that also causes a lot of confusion here is that the unconscious is not simply private, it's trans-individual. Without it meaning this, like in Jung, it's a collective unconscious. It exists at the level of language itself, since insofar as we emerge as individuals, we are the product of differential linguistic systems. So my personal unconscious is a matter of how I enter this trans-individual system, which is the, trans the, the, the wider unconscious, effectively. <coughs> okay, two, Lacan writes very little. Uh, in English, there are only a few minor collections of scattered lectures, and then, uh, then his accrete, um, uh, as far as, as published texts go. Um, there's an addi additional posthumous volume of Autre accrete in French. Um, but his core teaching is not that. His core teaching is, takes the form of 25 years of seminars uh, with a bonus seminar zero and minus one, if you count them. Um, and the official editions of these are still trickling out in French and are still arriving even more slowly in English. Um, also, they're not, being arri they're not arriving sequentially. So in English at the moment, you currently have official versions of seminars 1, 2, 3, 7, 11, 17, and 20. And this month, this very month, seminar 10 is coming out. Um, so each of these seminars has in the region of 20 sessions and is, it would be roughly a 300-page book. So that means that for every page that can published in the form of a Cree and, and things like text like that, there's probably about 10 pages worth of seminars. Um, and that's where you know, now we tend to look for the, the real Lacanian uh, teaching, I suppose. Um, despite the limitations on the official edited seminars, they are available in a much less official sense online, so you can get the entire French selection very easily online. And there's a website called Lacan in Ireland that has almost the complete English translation of this unofficial textual version. So you can read all of the seminars, but we just don't have the officially edited and published ones. You can also buy the unofficial ones at the Carnac Bookshop by Freud's House in London if you want to spend a lot of money. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, Lacan engages with philosophy directly, uh, unlike Freud. While Freud's indirect engagement is really with Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, Lacan engages mainly with Hegel, who um, is arguably about as far from Nietzsche as you can get. Um, it's noticeable that Lacan has almost no interest in Nietzsche, so he's a very different kind of psychoanalysis with regard to his philosophical influences. He has an interest in Heidegger, he met Heidegger a few times, 
Paddy apparently thought he was crazy. He said, the, the doctor is crazy. Um, of course, there's also a great little discussion of thinkers ranging from Plato and Aristotle to Bentham and Sartre. So philosophers come up a lot. Philosophers also attended his seminar. So the great Hegelian John Hippolyte uh, attended and was an active participant in the early seminars. And later on, you have a lot of the, the seminar moves for a while, so they're called Master Superior, and has a lot of the main uh, uh, French students, particularly Althusser students, attending the seminar. So you end up with a lot of philosophers there. He's talking to philosophers about philosophy a lot of the time. Okay, point four. I would suggest we now live in a golden age of Anglo-American Lacanian scholarship, which is why you should all start caring about the can now, because it's become a lot easier to do so and a lot clearer. Um, there have been many golden ages of Lacan's scholarship. There have been those around the Cahiers d'Analyse in France, there were those around the Cahiers de Cinema in Screen in England. Um, there was the so-called Essex School, which started right here. Um, and of course, there's most famously the Slovenian School um, around Zizek. And there's also, of course, excellent scholarly work by other figures, like Bruce Fink, who translated the Acre. However, what's been really interesting and very specific in philosophy in the last few years is that there's a bunch of very young, very bright scholars who are taking on Lacan in his own terms within philosophy. That is to say, traditionally, uh, philosophers turn to Lacan largely because of his contribution to established debates in philosophy. So we'd say, yes, Lacan may be a psychoanalyst, but he actually writes a lot about Hegel, and he engages in this discussion about Hegel here. And so as people are interested in Hegel, we should be interested in Lacan. And that's the kind of justification for how you would get into Lacan as a philosopher. Um, that's not what's happening now. What's happening in these interesting new works is um, notably Pluff and Chiesa's work in uh, 2007 and Ayer's book in 2012, is that they don't justify Lacan's philosophical interest on the basis of what he said about Hegel or about Heidegger or how he engaged with the debates of traditional continental philosophy. They take him on on his own terms. So Pluff asks, what is the Lacanian account of freedom? Chiesa asks, what is the Lacanian account of subjectivity? Um, Ayer asks, what is the Lacanian real? They regard this as interesting in itself about having to justify that the Lacanian real has some relevance to debates going on in Hegel or Heidegger. So Lacan is now seen as a producer of new concepts rather than just a contributor to established debates. Okay. Um, it would take a whole lecture to explain this, but number five is the most famous distinction in Lacan, which is between three registers. There's the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. Where Lacan gets um, complicated is around the fact that most objects that are relevant in psychoanalysis exist in all three different registers. So um, while Freud might have talked about the phallus in relation to the mother, in Lacan you'll get told about the separate conflicts and the different, acti dif different activities happening between the imaginary phallus, the symbolic phallus, and the real phallus in relation to the imaginary mother and the symbolic mother and the real mother, and this makes it get a lot more complicated. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I don't want to get into today. Um, so I'm not going to get into this except to say that the imaginary order is obviously of the, image, of the order of images and the order of fantasies, the symbolic order is of the order of uh, differentially ordered symbolic systems and is thus most closely related to structuralism. And the real is that which is neither imaginary nor symbolic. In Lacan's early thought, it's simply kind of outside of the symbolic, while in his later thought, it becomes largely something that emerges from a lack or an inconsistency within the symbolic itself, an overflow or excess. And this notion of the real as rupture, and a rupture in a structure is what we can associate with post-structuralism. So to give the most basic articulation of these three registers, if a symbolic system is inconsistent, if there's a problem in the very systematicity of the system, if it fails to close on itself, that is to say, if there is a real that emerges from the structure that cannot be incorporated into its system, then the, and then that gap, which is real, is normally covered over by an imaginary fantasy. So there you have an articulation of the three uh, layers. You have an articulation of the symbolic, the real, and the imaginary uh, in this way. And insofar as we expose the fantasy as a fantasy, insofar as we expose the, the gap of the real and the symbolic, uh, we gain some kind of purchase or criticism of the, of the system itself, and that's why Lacan is so useful as a theorist of politics and ideology. So to give an example of that, uh, Marx tells us that the symbolic system that is capitalism, the flow of capital across a vast network of places, is inconsistent. If you just let capitalism run like a machine in the corner, it will generate contradictions and it will collapse. Uh, capitalism is not a stable system. It doesn't close on itself. It produces conflicts that will destroy it inevitably. However, that inconsistency, that gap of the real in the symbolic that is the flow of capital, is covered over by imaginary fantasies. And so capitalism survives on the basis of the fact that you have various fantasies that make you think that it is a consistent system. You think the reason why the economy isn't doing well is because um, there's these benefit cheats and immigrants and they're coming into our country. Or alternatively, you think there's a worldwide conspiracy of Jewish bankers. Uh, whatever your particular thing is, um, you, you tend to think that um, if, we, if we expose this fantasy, if we expose how the, you're wrong about this, that actually the basis, basic form of capitalism itself is unsustainable and is self-destructing, 
then in some say one sense we'll have a, you know, potentially a collapse of the system, or potentially overcoming or at least some kind of power with regard to it. So this is why Lacan is an interesting theorist of uh, uh, ideology. And this is why the Lacanian concept of the, of the psychoanalytic cure will be seen as traversing the fantasy. So you come to appreciate how the symbolic that is your uh, personal uh, uh, system through which you interact with the world is structured around a uh, fantasy. And if you get rid of that, there's a lack in the very symbolic system itself. And the cure will be uh, coming to appreciate how your world is structured by fantasy. Not that you get rid of the fantasy, because if you got rid of the fantasy, your entire world would collapse. You'd lose everything. So you just come to have some kind of relation to the fantasy. You come to understand that it is a fantasy and what purpose it's serving, and that itself allows you a kind of advance. Okay, six. The whole childhood dynamic of the Oedipus complex uh, in Freud, the desire for the mother and the hatred of the father, is remodeled by Lacan in a way that we enter, as, as the way we enter into language, and the way the subject and their particular unconscious are formed. So again, I don't want to go into this, um, but you know, this is what psychoanalysis is about. It's about the entrance of uh, how uh, Tolstoy said there is, um, there's only a step between a five-year-old and an adult. There's only a step between a five-year-old and me, Tolstoy said. But um, between a baby and a five-year-old, there is an appalling distance. Um, so psychoanalysis is really about that appalling distance. Imagine the gap between being a helpless baby merely screaming to being a five-year-old. You're already kind of oriented. You're oriented within language. That's what psychoanalysis is about. But what is language in this broad sense? So, seven, we have this notion of the big other, other capitalized. Um, and the other that we're talking about in, in phrase, and this is the same other that we're talking about in our phrases, like there is an other of the other and there is no other of the other. That's the big other. Um, so language here is not just the language you speak. Um, it's the entire network of, di of a differentially structured system and laws that make up a linguistic society. It's notions like the queen and the way you should treat the queen. Uh, that's part of language. Um, it's the notion of the university student and the established structure of a lecture that determines how loudly you can cough right now about it being rude. Uh, it's the structure of what a lecturer is and whether I'm allowed to swear or whether I can scratch myself and how obvious I can be when I scratch myself uh, while lecturing. Uh, it's the circulation of money, it's the circulation of theses in waste pipes, it's the notion of artwork or the notion of poverty, it's the notion of a father figure, it's the notion of fashion. All of these things are linguistic differential systems that are part of the big other. So the big other as language is not just you know, cat, dog, run, it's everything in this sense. Um, it's law, uh, it's human culture. Um, so the resolution of the Oedipus complex then should be understood as entering the symbolic, um, entering the big other, adopting a role within it. Uh, even before I was born, I was already determined by various material facts uh, the place I would be seen to occupy in the big other. I was already determined as, you know, he's masculine, uh, he's white, etc., etc. These things are already determined. But when I was a baby, I hadn't appropriated those roles. I didn't know I was a boy, I didn't know I was white, I didn't know what those things meant. There's some point between the age of zero and the age of five when the child enters into the symbolic, where they start to accept themselves. They start to think of themselves, I'm a boy, I like playing with guns. Uh, they start doing various things like that, um, and they take on the role that they'd already been assigned, they appropriate it. Um, and so for Lacan, most of the basic forms of mental illness involve problems entering the symbolic, problems in actually accessing and coming into your role that's already been mapped out for you, or the role that you are being forced to adopt, the forms that you're being pushed into. Okay, and then very briefly, signifier signified, I know Peter and Steve talked to you about this, so um, in classical structural linguistics, a sign is composed of two elements. There's the signifier, or concrete sound image, and there's the signified, or conceptual meaning. In Lacan, there's no natural unity of the sign. The signified is a particular meaning effect that emerges on the basis of a combination of material signifiers. Um, if I say that, for example, as we saw in the earlier quote, you cannot guarantee the concrete consequences of any manifestation of the signifier, what that means is that the concrete consequences would be the signified meaning. I cannot guarantee the signified meaning that will emerge from any combination of words that I put together as material signifiers. I don't know if you'll take me as being sarcastic. I don't know if you'll think I'm lying, if you think I'm acting. I have no way of controlling that. Um, if I was in a theater and I'm a performer and I've noticed there's a fire backstage and I run out on stage and I say, there's a fire, you should get out of here, you might well go, oh, this is very good theater. And you might sit there and I might run over and start shaking you and going, no, there's a fire, there's a fire. And there's nothing I can do that makes you actually appreciate there's really a fire. You think I'm just acting, you're involved in some fantastic experimental piece of theatre. So, this is a kind of a problem that we face with the signifier. So what does the mythical post-structuralist actually believe? The constructed bogeyman of the Anglo-American Academy is imagined somewhat along the lines of the nihilists in The Big Lebowski, 
uh, screaming about how they believe in nothing um, and involving themselves in contradictions as they do so. And perhaps, as Walter says, worse than Nazis, because say what you like about the tenets of National Socialism, dude, at least it's an ethos. So, <laughs> post-structuralists are, are similar to that. Above all, they're seen as not believing in truth and believing that anything can mean anything. It's the, the really chaotic thing. It's kind of like an anarchism of language. Uh, if you believe anything can mean anything, then how can we do philosophy? This is the thing they'll get shouted at them. So the standard genealogy of the movement runs that there was a moment of great structuralist hubris when academics in Paris believed they were on the edge of cracking the genuine science of language, of man, of society. And then a bunch of younger thinkers, notably Foucault, Derrida, and Deleuze, rediscovered Nietzsche, normally a version of Nietzsche articulated around this quote, which I won't bother to read to you, and it's on the basis of this Nietzschean revelation that they tried to expose the scientific pretensions of their age. So the normal Anglo-American lament is that the wacky French just go to extremes. From believing that structuralism would offer a science of man as rigorous as physics, they've jumped to saying that no science at all is possible. Um, on the basis of reading Nietzsche, that truth is a lie, that anything could mean anything, that reason and logical thought themselves are a masculine obsession and conspiracy, that it needs to be broken with through the liberation of feminine writing, that philosophy should be approached as a mode of literature, and it's all a pretty dumb story when you tell it in that way, um, but it's one that you'll hear all over the place. So, in actual fact, I think the movement from structuralism to post-structuralism, as I'm trying to portray it here, has far more to do with uh, Bertrand Russell than it has to do with Nietzsche, literature or rhetoric, or rather, the turn to Nietzsche, literature and rhetoric um, as relevant concerns emerges because of a problem in structure that's far closer to the kind of concerns Russell had than the kind of concerns Nietzsche had. Nobody was convinced by reading Nietzsche to reject science. There was a problem in science that led to the relevance of Nietzsche. So the name of that problem in science, in Lacanian vocabulary, is that there is no other of the other. And it is indeed associated with the feminine in opposition to the masculine, as we saw earlier, through those uh, formulas, and I'm going to explain that in this, in this class. So, um, none of our earlier story is simply false. Post-structuralists really do call a, talk about things like masculine writing and the liberation of feminine writing. They really do deny that we can guarantee the concrete consequences of language. And in a sense, that does mean anything can mean anything. Um, but the way they do this, the reason they do this, is nothing to do with the kind of theoretical anarchism that often gets attached to them. And so what we want to do is to use a relatively formal account of what the difference is to see why it happened, what's actually going on. And there are very good reasons to refer to this as philosophy taking into account the death of God, and that's what we'll see here. But, like I say, these are not consequences of reading Nietzsche, they're consequences of a, a general, the widely acknowledged mathematical paradox, and one that you already believe and think in terms of. That's the real key to it, is that you already know this. Okay, so we're finally able to get onto this, which is the Bible, Genesis 2.19. We always begin with the Bible in my classes. I'm technically now a lecturer in religion, so um, I have to do that. <laughs> So, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found help meet for him. Um, this is a fantastical myth. Uh, God has already created the animals. The animals are already different, they're already lined up by God before man, ordered in accordance with their manifest, correct, created differences. We can imagine this moment as the forerunner of the animals opening the, entering the ark in Noah, so the animals are lined up two by two effectively, there's this yellow animal with sharp teeth and claws, and he comes forward and Adam sits there and he goes, lion, um, and that's its name. And then there's this small brown animal that comes forward with these big teeth, and, and Adam goes, squirrel. And so he does this, you know, so he gets a job in creation, but it's not a very important job, uh, because the system of differences has already been produced by God himself, and there's no question over whether it's the right system of differences. All that's lacking is the sound to go with each already demarcated difference. So in Lacanian diagrammatic terms, uh, you might draw that like this. There's God, God creates a system of differences, and this is the only bit Adam gets to come in, he gets to like assign differences that will go along with them. Um, now, if you've ever investigated the great difficulties faced by contemporary biologists when they uh, address the so-called species problem, you'll know that this entire picture is completely false. 
Um, in reality, there's not a set number of neatly demarcated species out there just waiting for you to come along and name them. First, we need to decide on what a species is. And depending on the definition we produce and the test we invent in order to test that uh, in, in particular cases, we're going to come up with a very different idea of even how many species there are. Uh, for example, one of the common and very basic definitions and tests of two animals belonging to the same species is whether they can successfully mate and produce fertile offspring. But if you watch nature documentaries, you'll know that definition runs into all kinds of problems. Lots of animals don't mate. Some of them aren't sexual. Some of them have more than two sexes. Some animals involve other animals in their sexual processes. It's kinky. Nature is very confusing. So biologists have tried to offer other definitions. So they might say similarity of DNA, or they might say similar morphology. They might say fitting into a particular ecological niche. And all of these different options for what species actually are are you know, competing and different. And of course, produce different numbers of species in the first place. So the decision is arbitrary and pragmatic. And even after we've made one of those broad decisions, we then need to make further arbitrary decisions about the level of similarity required. So perhaps we say two animals must have 99.8% similar DNA to belong to the same species. But we could equally have said 99.7% similar DNA. And if we'd gone with 99.7 rather than 99.8, we'd have a different number of different types of species out there. So there's no right answer. When someone says 500 species are endangered in the Amazon because of logging, that's a pretty meaningless claim because what's a species? How are you defining species? What is, a, what, what is your criteria? Etc. These are all relevant issues. The environmentalist has very good reasons to push for 99.9% .9 similar DNA since that will mean there's more different species in the area under threat and each of those has smaller numbers. Uh, while the logging company has very good reason to push for like 99.5% because if you go with that then there's uh, far fewer species there. Each one of those species has far higher numbers, and there's far more likely to be members of that species also in some other forest down the road. So you can see how it's a political decision that can be adopted for pragmatic purposes in accordance with your particular ends. So the classic example in structuralism of this kind of um, thing is actually an argument about rivers. So in English, we just, has, anyone, has Petit or Stephen talked about this? They talk about fleurs. And, okay, I'm going to skip it there. Okay, good. Um, the reason it doesn't work is that God did not come along and say, you know, um, there are a set number of rivers, you need to name them all, and you have to sit there going, Nile, Thames, etc. Um, it could be quite possibly, you can have all kinds of different definitions of what a river is. You could say, you know, every flow of water is a river, um, so uh, every raindrop is its own river, and you could name them all. Take a long time, but, you know, it's a possibility. You could say every gutter uh, on a building is a river and give them a name. Um, or you could just have one word for river, you know, we could have a million words, you could be like an Eskimo and have supposedly a hundred words for snow, even though that's completely debunked. There's all kinds of possibilities with regard to language, and it's because God doesn't actually line stuff up and then give it to you to name. Actually, you're making decisions. So, what we might say then is that insofar as we stopped believing in this aspect of uh, the kind of theological picture, we are dealing with the world after the death of God. We're dealing with, you know, get rid of that, suddenly we have to create this system, we have to produce the structure of differences that we then live within. Um, so uh, this leads us with a kind of immense human freedom in that, on the one hand, we, we exist between two absolute poles. On the one hand, you can say everything is infinitely different. Or on the other hand, you can say everything is the same. And both of these are legitimate possibilities because God hasn't given us a set number of differences where we can say, no, actually, there's 1,263 different differences, uh, so you know, you're wrong. No, you can say everything's one, or you can say everything's infinitely different. The problem with adopting either of those stances is that science becomes impossible. If you say everything is infinitely different, including every moment being different from every other moment, including the fact that you say these are two raindrops and I say, no, 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 they're infinitely different. There's nothing you can say about them that makes them look even remotely the same to me. Um, then insofar as I do that, I can't do science. I can't have a science of raindrops. Insofar as I, on the other hand, say everything is one, and everything I look at, I go being, being, being. Um, again, I can't that, make predictions, I can't have a science of that kind of, uh, uh, within that system. So instead we adopt some middle ground. Some middle ground where we group, we order, we identify in accordance with certain criteria. And then we're allowed science. Science only comes insofar as you cut things in one, in one way in between these two poles. And if you adopt either pole, then there would not be any, um, any science. So we find in this theological model that for a rigorously demarcated system to exist, there must be a constitutive exception. That's the basic logic that we've got here. Yes, God created everything. Everything is created by God. God produced all of the differences between entities that define uh, the structure of being itself, except, of course, God. God didn't create God. 
God did not establish himself through the same process. So God here is what we call a transcendental signified. It's an ultimate signified that is exceptional with regard to the regime of signification uh, that originally produces the differences our rather inept language then fastens on. So what we see here then is already we're talking in terms of a recognizably masculine system. Um, we can say that in order to say um, all X is a P, everything is created by God, there has to be something which is exceptional with regard to that system, God himself. So the system of difference is produced by something outside of that system. Hopefully that makes sense. You can see why this is already, like I say, uh, masculine. Um, of course, we generally no longer believe in that kind of uh, transcendental signified, at least in that sense, whether you have faith in God or not, it's unlikely you believe that he created precisely 10,475 species of animal or anything like that. Not one more, not one less. Uh, there's a proper system of how many animals there are that we should line up with. We put it, people stopped believing that quite a long time ago. Um, so what you think is probably that, uh, like I say, the number of species around at any moment is a combination of what's actually going on in the world around you and this system of classification that you've decided on and you've adopted. So for example, a 99.8% similar DNA. Um, and I could have produced a different system as we saw, right? I say 99.7% instead. Yet while there's this arbitrary level where spontaneous, pragmatically decided rules produce different differential systems, I can produce one with 10 species of monkey or one with 20 species of monkey, depending on the criteria I choose to adopt, that should not distract us from the fact that there's a genuine articulation of differences that is materially out there in the world, completely independently from this decision. Um, whether I decide on a 99.7% or a 99.8% similar DNA to be of the same species, there's also the actual material fact of how many creatures there are with particular DNA patterns out there in the world going about their business. Um, that's going to determine how many species there are, there are under any particular criteria. So we have effectively two different processes of production. There's the free human production of a particular differential system for pragmatic purposes where I invent a criteria and I impose it on the world. But there's also a production of differences going on in the world itself, which is the actual production of animal life going on, everyone fucking. Uh, that kind of stuff is going on and producing the actual material real differences. So the very fact that in science one way of cutting up existence, such as having a discourse about material things, discourse about living things, discourse about gravity, etc., works much better than if I cut up existence. So I said, we're going to have a discourse about red things, a discourse about happy things, a discourse about curtains. Uh, the reason that one system works better and we have sciences like physics that are relatively well defined as opposed to sciences of red things, which would be a really, really rubbish science, is that reality itself is already materially articulated in particular ways. And like carving a turkey, when you cut up the world, you want to cut it up along its joints. You want to cut it in the right places. So what structuralism came to focus on is this process of the production of material differences itself. What God did in our earlier diagram, and what still depends on, according to the basic structuralist hypothesis, an exceptional element. Um, this is what Deleuze, in his essay, How Do You Recognize Structuralism, which is one of the most interesting essays about structuralism, calls the empty square. So the empty square is that which, establ which establishes a system of differences, but does not belong to that system of differences. So in the example of living animal species, the actual production of the real material system of differences that we might then cut up in various arbitrary ways, that underlying production involves certain processes that are radically alien to the kind of entities that are living animals. It involves the quasi-immortal mutating and self-replicating DNA code, for example. So this DNA code is not living. Um, it's not even necessarily a material thing. The DNA code is a kind of abstract status. It exists more in the manner of Charles, a book by Charles Dickens uh, exists as you know, an abstract combination of code. Um, it doesn't exist in any of its particular material manifestations. So DNA code is something radically alien to the order of the animal. And yet it's the process of DNA code replicating itself, mutating itself, uh, reasserting itself in various ways, in accordance with various processes, that produces um, the entire system of uh, differences. So, um, at a very, in one level, we have a similar kind of structure. We have this thing out there, it's a real thing in existence, obeying certain processes, much like God did, but now it's the processes of the DNA code itself, it's something we could have a science of, which in playing itself out across material entities and playing itself out across the animal kingdom produces the actual network of differences that we then impose some arbitrary classification principle upon in order to say there are 20 species in this room. 
Um, so, um, we see again, like I say, a constitutive exception. Um, we've granted an exceptional element, a kind of reality. Um, and at one level, we could say then that this is um, a way of in, in, uh, seeing the difference between um, structuralism and post-structuralism. So, uh, in, the, in the way we're going to use these terms and the way I'd like to explain them to you, um, if you think of the quasi-material, quasi-immortal DNA that produces this plethora of diverse biological <coughs> organisms, and you think that it's a rule-governed, uh, identifiable process that creates a system of differences that we can then talk about in our rather inept manner, that is, if you think there's a real movement of processes, a flow of DNA across cell borders occurring throughout the animal kingdom in accordance with certain set formalizable rules, then you might think of that as a kind of meta-language. That's a meta-language going on that's producing uh, what our actual language then hooks onto, which is based on some decision like 99.8% similar DNA means it's a, these two things are dogs. So, uh, in post-structuralism, there's no longer a belief in the law-governed dependability of this hidden structure of production. Rather than a comfortable model of there being a thing that is definitely DNA and is definitely obeying some precisely specifiable rules and processes, even if we can't quite see it, uh, there will be an openness to how all of this itself is also only a constructed language. It's not a meta-language outside of language that we then fasten onto. It itself <coughs> is only part of language. The entire discussion of DNA and the fantasy that it's outside of the biological kingdom, creating the biological kingdom, is itself this, this, uh, uh, um, a, a fantasy that we produce in order to create a uh, demarcated, understandable, interactable with uh, our animal kingdom that we can then do science on. So there's no actual meta-language according to post-structuralism. The production of differences is erratic. Uh, insofar as we do science and talk about genetics um, and quasi-immortal DNA and all of these things, um, and we can say true things about all of those things. We can you know, make true statements. It's not that science is wrong, but we're all basing this on the production of an, a regime or locus of truth, and the production of that locus of truth depended on some kind of fantasy, some kind of... Uh, 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 and I'd say, so, so this is the, the loose way that we're going to define what post-structuralism is. The, the, why I call it a loose level, though, is that um, the reason I said that there is... that a post-structuralism... Uh, the reason I said this is a loose definition is that really what I want to say when I say a post-structuralist or a structuralist is that what they're talking about when they say this, when they say these different systems, is the system of all systems. They're not talking about particular systems. A post-structuralist can say there's a structuralist system. A structuralist can say there's an erratic system that doesn't obey structural laws. They're not going to get confused by that. They're not going to get thrown by it. It doesn't matter how biology happens to function. It doesn't matter how rivers happen to function. What matters uh, is the ultimate system, the set of all sets, the universal set, what is, out, what is the ultimate level of discourse. And the question with regard to the ultimate level of discourse would be, uh, is it masculine or feminine? Does it have a constitutive exception? Does it have an outside of itself that produces order within it? Or is it erratic? Um, that would be effectively what's at stake in uh, the distinction between structuralism and post-structuralism as it's unveiled in the camp. So, for a structuralist, the assumption is at the ultimate level of the structure of a set of all sets, there is this constitutive exception, producing the basic fields of discourse, parceling them out correctly, and the post-structuralist denies this. They say that there is no structure of structures, there is no set of sets, there is no ultimate law governing, regulating, localizing, and ensuring difference. So, of course, in Lacan, the set of all sets we've already seen would be the big other. The big other contains language, laws, culture, everything intelligible. And what Lacan appreciates when he says there is no other of the other, is that there's no law governing the big other. What Lacan had earlier believed, prior to this, prior to 58, was that there was a law governing the big other, and the law governing the big other was called the paternal law, it's called the name of the father, and uh, we accept it in overcoming the Oedipus complex. Um, so the change that comes about um, is, is here is the original system. We have experience shows us the indispensability of the background provided by the other with respect to the other, without which the universe of language could not articulate it. <coughs> so there is the other with regard to the other, the other with regard to the material system, which is necessary for language to articulate itself, necessary for symbolic chains to form, necessary for, for language to function in the early Lacan. What we're finding in the later Lacan is he's saying there is no other of the other. There's nothing outside. Actually, this is just 
one average thing among that. Um, insofar as you push it up here and produce a system of differences, um, you are engaging in a fantasy. And even though then, once you've engaged in that fantasy, there are then truths within that fantasy. Truths emerge within it. Um, so what's, what Lacan is saying when he says there's no other of the other is he's saying that um, uh, there's no met meta language. There's nothing outside of language. Everything is imminent to language. There's no. What was interesting? Let's just stress that first. I suppose is that um, uh, well, Lacan did differently in his early system is that rather than making it God out here or the underlying processes of uh, DNA, etc., um, something real, material out there in the actual world. Well, Lacan did, he said that this, this entry point is the name of the father. It's not the father. It's not the father out there. It's actually just the name. It's, this, it's a linguistic construct. It's a signifier. So in the early Lacan, you'll see that instead of having a transcendental signifier, like God who creates the system of differences, you have a transcendental signifier. You have a single signifier placed outside of the regime of signification, which ensures order, ensures difference, produces a differential system, regulates it. Um, and what we see later on, like I say, is that there is no actual transcendental signifier, or insofar as there is a transcendental signifier, it's a kind of fantasy. So, um, um, this is expressed here. So, um, this is an insubversion of the subject. That is set out from the conception of the other um, as the locus of the signifier. Any statement of authority has no other guarantee than its very enunciation. And it is pointless for it to seek in another signifier which could not appear outside of this locus in any way. Which is what I mean when I say that no meta-language can be spoken, or more aphoristically, there is no other of the other. So the point is that uh, within the locus of the signifier, um, there is nothing, there's no, no signifier outside of it that could appear outside of it and that could guarantee it. There's nothing external, there's no constitutive exception at the ultimate level of the big other. Of course, particular systems have constitutive exceptions, but at the level of the great overall system, there isn't one. What that means is that um, we can't localize the big other, we can't close it. There's nothing outside of it, there's no background to it. It's not locatable, it's not in a particular place. It's inconsistent, it's open. And all of that's equivalent to saying that it doesn't exist. So, there is no, of the other, there is no other of the other is exactly the same statement as the big other does not exist. The big other does not exist does not mean there aren't signifiers. It means there isn't a single locus that is the big other, that obeys the law, that functions properly. Instead, there's scattered language that we take to be the big other insofar as we're deluded. Um, so, and you've got to be deluded, because if you weren't deluded, you'd have nothing. So, deluded is fine. That's why we said at the very beginning of this lecture, the non duped air, which also means the non duped pair, the name of the father. The name of the father, the non duped air, is the same statement as saying, don't think you can be smarter than this. You have to be misguided, you have to be, believe in fancy, you have to fall into fancy in order to have a workable system. So the entrance in language that, uh, that's, is, is a kind of delusion, um, since language is not actually a place you can enter, it's inconsistent, it's riddled with holes, the big other <coughs> is crossed out, it's divided, it's scattered, um, it's represented by A with a line for it, A with a line for it means that you know, the big other doesn't exist, it's barred, it's not consistent. Um, and it's crossed out because it's very construction, it's very production, the production of the system of differences produces absurdities. Like Marx's account of capital, the production of this symbolic system itself leads to its own annihilation, its own destruction. Um, and the only way that we can ignore that fact is through engaging in active fantasy. And so the, the symbolic system's real point that would tear it apart is covered over by a fantasy at the level of the imaginary, which allows you to think that the symbolic system functions which allows science to take place. Science is based on illusion, but that doesn't mean that there aren't truths. It just means that every truth is based on a fundamental illusion. So what this means is that insofar as you believe there is a big other, and the notion of the big other is absolutely essential for society to function, for science to take place, for knowledge to be produced, um, since the big other is the very locus of truth, it's the treasury of signifiers, all of this is sustained by fantasy and repression. So it's not that there's no such thing as truth. Of course there's truth. One plus one equals two. Yet that truth does depend on an underlying act of repression that establishes the very place and space of truth. And you might think, one plus one equals two doesn't depend on repression. Um, but yes, this applies even in mathematics. Um, that's actually the target of the first great um, Lacanian text not written by Lacan, 
which is Shakala Miller's Sutra. And so if you read Sutra, um, this is entirely about how the production of the number line itself uh, depends on an act of repression. And most people hear that and they go, oh, that's crazy. It's entirely based on Frege, but in a rather wacky reading, admittedly. But the point is that there is this fantasy at the basis of the production of a system, which is then completely reliable. There's nothing wrong with maths. It's not that, you know, because of this fundamental fantasy, one plus one might equal three tomorrow. That's not a possibility. The system is consistent. It functions. But it depends on a certain kind of repression and covering up. And the system of systems, the ultimate system, does not exist. There is no outside of it. There is, there is only, it can only be seen to exist on the basis of um, an act of fantasy. So, why I said earlier that the move from structuralism to post-structuralism has more to do with Russell than Nietzsche is that um, Russell's paradox was, of course, to show precisely there's no set of all sets. There's no, um, there's no universal set. And it's exactly the fact that there's no universal set that means that in uh, zermel frenkel set theory, um, there's only multiplicities and infinite hierarchies without that, those infinite hierarchies eventually forming into a one or at the top that would then be the complete totality of things. And this is why Badiou uses set theory to think infinite difference without the unifying principle of a one that ultimately everything is. So we can see all of this is exactly the same thing that goes on in Badiou and it goes on more clearly in Badiou through problems in logic, problems that emerge in logic. But even in Lacan, it's absolutely a problem in logic. He's not read Nietzsche and gone, oh, I'm going to reject all that repressive notion of truth. I'm going to believe in metaphors and read literature. No, it's very rigorous statement. In, you know, buy it or don't buy it, but you know, that's what it's trying to be. Um, so insofar as we assume the paternal law, uh, we, assu uh, we assume that there's an exception, uh, which we do whenever we engage in science. We're, and so whenever we engage in science, we're involved in a masculine system. Insofar as on the contrary, if we were to accept that there is no exception to a language, if we were to accept that there does not exist an X which is not P, if we were to accept that there's nothing outside of the chain of signifiers, there's no external thing, then we end up with this other statement, not all X's are P. Now, the not all there is the puzzling element that um, means that we can't actually refer to the system itself. We can't talk about it. Um, so, I hope I still have time to do this example. I'm going to skip one example, which was kind of the main example of my talking questions, and jump to the secondary example, which is an example of the feminine system that comes up in um, Zizek's uh, For They Know Not What They Do. So one of the central parts of Zizek's entire academic career is showing that these apply all over the place. You're already using them. They're not weird laws about sexuality that never come up. In fact, when you analyze all kinds of things from movies, whatever, you're already thinking in terms of these, just as I tried to show that you're already thinking in terms of this when you talk about the Bible and about, the, uh, about God offering us the animals to be named. So similarly, what Zizek's generally doing is, uh, is, is finding examples of these. He finds a lovely example of a feminine system in, uh, in they, know, they Know What They Do, um, which is what happens when you make the declaration uh, there is nothing that is not political. So what happens when you make the statement uh, there is nothing that's not political uh, is that um, in accordance with the logic of the not all, we can't say that this means everything is political. It doesn't result in the statement everything is political. It results in the statement that not all is political. That's what goes along with it. So there is nothing which is not political. There is no element which is not a political element. Reduces, produces, goes along with the statement, not all is political. Why? What would that mean? Surely that's strange. And again, we saw that, of course, feminine logic is a paradoxical logic here. So, what it means is that the political as a social field is marked by a split. There's no neutral point from which society can be conceived as a whole. Any description of a political society, any attempt to define the political, any attempt to have a science of the political, any attempt to have a rational conversation about politics will itself be marked by a particular partisan political perspective. So there is no way you can talk about politics in general. There's no way you can even introduce the word politics. Not, uh, the, the politics, in a sense, is shown to be radically inconsistent and to not exist because everything is political. Because, well, because, sorry, because there is not anything which is not political. So if you want an example of that, of course, I mean, you know, if you're Margaret Thatcher, then you're going to say, um, you believe in the existence of individuals and the existence of families, but you don't believe in the existence of society. And so when you talk about the political, you're talking about a domain which consists of individuals and families and the state. 
It doesn't have something like society. Whereas if you're a communitarian and you're engaging in a political debate with them and you say, I also agree that there's nothing that's not political, you're then going to be basing it on you know, the fact that you believe in society. You might, not, you might not even believe in the individual. You might believe that the relevant political entity is the society, that individuals are just abstract products of society. So you're going to have a completely different idea of what the domain of the political is. There's no way that, you two, that two people coming at each other, even though they're both agreeing, there's nothing that's not political. Um, they're going to be radically split, and that's what the political is. The political is the split. The political is not that one of them's right. The political is not that actually the politics is really about society, or actually politics is really about individuals and family and Thatcher's right. Politics is a word that designates a fundamental split, a disagreement, and that disagreement is class struggle. So class struggle is a word for the fact that politics is split, which means you can't talk about politics, which means that not all is political. Not all is political because you can't even engage with the political. You can't talk about it at the universal level without having already adopted a partisan stance. And you can't offer a science of the political, you can't offer economics or anything else without having made some kind of decision with regards to your own political stance, without having entered the symbolic in a particular way. And to do that, you will depend on an act of fantasy whereby you see society in certain terms based on an imaginary image which covers over the inconsistency in the real, which is the actual political realm because the political realm is not designatable, it's inconsistent, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. That's really what I wanted to say as my attempt to define what I think post-structuralism would mean. Uh, this notion of there being no other or the other, this notion of there being no law governing differences, I think is, is most clearly expressed on the basis of this fact of, of the, like I say, that uh, if you go down the route of saying, but the ultimate question is not about politics, the ultimate question is not about DNA and life. The ultimate question is about the system of all systems, the entrance into the system of all systems. And according to uh, Lacan and Bertrand Russell, which is a statement you don't get very often, <laughs> the system of all systems, the set of all sets, does not exist. So um, that is why I would like to say that you know, it's a very sensible position. Underneath it all. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break for everyone just to go and get some water or to smoke a cigarette or something and then we'll get back again. <coughs> okay. So, the real moves from being an outside of, of the symbolic system, um, that which is not included in the symbolic system, that which is, uh, uh, escapes the possibility of symbolization, to being something that arises within the very production of the existence of the symbolic system, and that means that the symbolic system can only offer itself as a locus of truth insofar as certain gaps are sutured, certain gaps are covered over. So, with regard to that system, do you have a further, more specific question? Um, yeah, but, um, and just as the real itself, I mean, is it something that we can experience as well? And, and is there a particular moment in our lives where we sort of come close to the real, real? Is there something we have to do in order to sort of see the real? Um, there are ways of reading Lacan that some people come up with where this is, you know, you know, where they start from individual experience and they start to think about things like, you know, the, the encounter with death as, 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 a, as an encounter with the real, for example. So, sort of like, you know, anxiety before death. And so these would be the kind of uh, concerns that you'd have expressed in the, the seminar that's just coming out now, which is Seminar 10 on Anxiety. Um, there'll be some notion of, of something like um, contact with the real when in the face of certain things that break down symbolic systems. So you might think there's some kind of um, contact with the real in the moment when you unmask the fantasy that's covering over um, the fact that your symbolic system of truth is based on that fantasy. So you, you break down the imaginary fantasy. And when you break down the imaginary fantasy and you're exposed, you, then, you are then exposed to the real in some sense. Your uh, symbolic system is, you, you have the experience of a collapse of personality. So a psychotic is exposed to the real. But also someone being cured to some extent is being exposed to the real, because they're being exposed to that which is beyond the possibility of symbolization. They're being exposed to something like you know, their desire for their mother, for example, something like that that is like, you know, outside the possibility of their comprehension. So there is definitely a sense in which um, you are <coughs> exposed to the real in the psychoanalytic process, or you are constantly exposed to the real in psychosis. So it's not necessarily a good thing. It's not good to be psychotic. Um, but uh, at the same time, to 
to have gone through a psychoanalytic cure also means that you are aware of your dependence on fantasy, you're aware of how fantasy functions, and through that very awareness, through having a kind of, you have a kind of distance from yourself, and maybe that means that you are less prone to being attacked by the real. You're less a hostage of it than you would be if you just um, were naively living within the context of a certain imaginary fantasy, living within a certain regime of truth, but always potentially expose something that shockingly breaks with that system. So, for example, if you were uh, in, in capitalism and you don't realize that capitalism doesn't work, um, and suddenly the, you know, the revolution breaks out around you, that's in a sense an exposure of the real, because you realize that actually all of your imaginary fantasies that were saying, you know, the only reason things aren't working out is because of uh, those Jewish bankers or those immigrants, uh, suddenly those, those fantasies are unmasked and you're exposed to the fact that the, the real, <coughs> the symbolic system of capitalism itself has a gap in it and is prone to collapse. And everything you depended on, everything you thought you could bank on, everything that made you think that you know, your life was secure and safe and that you know, one, you know, you'll be fine and you know, it's worth getting your education because it's going to mean a job 10 years down the line, all of that goes away because we're swept back to some post-apocalyptic, post-financial post collapse age. When that kind of thing happens, yeah, you are being exposed to the real. You're being exposed to something that was you know, beyond your system of symbolization that was the system within which you lived. You lived perfectly happily within a world of capitalism. It all seemed to be working out. It was all going fine. Suddenly, boom, um, you have to remake a new symbolic in a new post-apocalyptic world. Um, and yeah, so this, this is a, a, an experience of the real. Um, there's also, of course, the experience of the real that, you know, there's a certain passion for the real that people like uh, Badiou talk about a lot, and they characterize the 20th century in terms of it. There's a, and you know, can have even naive, naive, naive versions of it, like you know, this this urge to really live in the moment, or to you know, you should be um, uh, spend every moment of your life uh, snowboarding with a Pepsi Cola in your hand, uh, maybe skydiving occasionally, uh, and this will be really living your life. You know, this is some kind of you know urge to for exposure to that which is beyond the system we normally live in. You have some kind of thrill and urge, like, you know, oh, you're just living in the, what, what's being given to you. I am on the edge. Uh, all of that's a kind of, again, urges for the real. So the real shoots through our behavior and the symbolic and the imaginary in all kinds of ways. Uh, you mentioned Lorenzo Gieser. Um, so there's one more question over there. Ah, sorry, sorry. You mentioned, you mentioned Lorenzo Kiesa a bit, a bit towards the beginning of your presentation, and uh, you mentioned him as a sort of distinctive uh, Lacanian project in the sense that he does introduce Lacan into uh, some, on the top of some other uh, intellectual trajectory. Can you briefly summarize the, the, the Lacan of Lorenzo Chiesa and how it distinguishes itself from... Because you seem to be fairly right. fond of that approach. If I right, yeah. Natural. I mean, I, I would say that these new thinkers, I'm, I'm sort of seeing them as a wave, um, and why I'd say that we have a little golden age going on is, is not specifically the content of what they're saying as being any different from the kind of content you could have got in Bruce Fink. There's certain emphases that are different, you know, they're, they're paying very great attention to the seminars rather than the accre. Um, they are uh, approaching it as philosophers and engaging in a certain kind of uh, close reading with regard to the seminars. Um, and a tracking of the history of the Cannes Fort in certain ways. Um, and those are interesting, but they're not what's really fundamental. I mean, I think what's, what's fundamental is that um, there has reached a point because of the fact that people like Zizek and etc. have made it so that uh, political theory, aesthetics, everyone else is already concerned about the Can, that now it's interesting to engage with the Kenyan concepts and to unpack them and to work out what's really going on in them at the most detailed level possible, which was not a concern that ever entered people's minds in the 80s, or because when in the 80s, when you were talking about Lacan, you were trying to justify it, and when you were trying to justify it, you were saying either it's really relevant when we're talking about cinema, or you were saying it's really relevant if you're talking about Hegel or Heidegger, and it, you know, so people would write books about, you know, how, uh, how the death drive in Lacan specifically relates to being towards death, because that's the only way you could get people interested in it, and I think that's what's changed. What's changed is really a, a change of environment, because now, most people ask questions, like, like Thomas is there, of like, you know, but, but what really is the, the real? That's a question that someone actually now asks. And so you have someone like Tom Ayres, who produces a book, you know, The Can on the Real. It doesn't justify itself on any other basis. It doesn't say, you know, uh, you should know about the real because X, Y, Z. Of course, that, that's implicitly there, but it assumes an audience that already wants a detailed unpacking of a concept which is specifically Lacanian and that doesn't need to be told, and it's interesting because. 
I think that's really the, the, the crux of the new movement. So it's, it's, it's a very minor change, but I think it's pretty fundamental because we're now actually really engaging in a close reading of Lacan rather than articulating Lacan with other thinkers, which is what always used to go on in philosophy. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it, even though it was introductory. So I have a long question. I was going to say, even though it was wrong. <laughs> no, I have a long question. I have problems. And uh, maybe I can start with a problem oh, you're going to weigh me. related to your last remark. Um, that now we can, in fact, you think that it is important that we can approach the Lacanian corpus the, of uh, you know, writings uh, not as an appendix to uh, other classical philosophical thinkers uh, and their questions, but uh, with a kind of set of questions that is in itself relevant to pose for a thinker. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we go into the Lacanian corpus looking for questions of truth, of sexuality, of uh, love, and so on and so forth. And so my question would be, um, the, the first part of the question would be, um, you seem to suggest at the beginning of your presentation, but also I think you gave a couple of hints throughout your presentation, that the Come, the going back uh, to the Nietzschean corpus uh, was not due to the fact that uh, these philosophers like Deleuze, uh, Derrida, and so on and so forth, uh, Foucault, uh, uh, were uh, really interested in what philosophically Nietzsche had to say in its own respect, but to what Nietzsche could add to the kind of more positivistic, structuralist, historical, philosophical movement that was going on throughout France at that time. And uh, I, I'm worried, uh, or I am concerned, if you are trying to reduce, if you were trying to reduce the, um, you know, the rereading of classical authors uh, to um, a kind of more uh, progressive, scientific, historical account or what went on, because I consider uh, Deleuze, Derrida, perhaps Foucault, and I'm not sure, uh, as classical authors by themselves, so authors that wouldn't be themselves reducible to that historical movement of progression. This brings me to the question. So is the, is the possibility, and I'm going to read it for just to spare time, uh, to save time. Is the possibility of science or episteme that which makes philosophy a philosophy that responds to, for instance, the problem, the classical philosophical problems of difference and identity, of universality and particularity, uh, after the death of God? Is, is philosophy redu reducible to epistemology? That's the question. And uh, um, I think that this seems to point at least to. Um, one thing when you, when you are talking about the, the death of God which would be to trying to give an, a temporal diachronic account of the symbolic um, even a genetic a genealogical account to reevaluate the creator to reevaluate the concept of or the idea of God if not the like caricature like figure of a uh, God that you know comes and creates with his finger everything beneath him, like you were trying to portray, and um, not of devaluate him to put more shit over the idea of God, as it were, but um, or if we don't like to call it God, to that, to that thing, to that, to the that which uh, cannot be reduced to the system of differences which is the standardized or spatialized uh, notion of language first adopted in structuralism via the positive science of in the siècle Europe, general linguistic uh, by Saussure, but even by grammarians and philologists in the late 19th century. This brings me to the second point. Once <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to stop here? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I, it is comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the people, yeah. uh, once the meta language is abolished, what do we make of the very Freudian, you know, discovery, which is starting from, you know, the great masterpiece of interpretation of dreams, the first of 19. Oh, uh, 19th uh, century, 1901, I can't remember exactly the date. What do we make of the poetic logic that he theorizes? Uh, or uh, of more classical uh, ideas, for instance, of the Platonic or Hegelian idea of the good, of the beautiful, of the just. I think they're related, and we, can, we could expand after. The problem is how you account for the fantasy, how not that fantasy covers up the fact that there is nothing, but basically the, the, the problem is why do we pick up one discrete element from the series and we basically, uh, that could be the law of progress in history, like in Stalinism, uh, um, in the, or the progress in the human sciences, in the great progress towards, uh, you know, scientific knowledge, uh, in, or in having a nice bourgeois life, etc., etc. And we elevate this single element to uh, be the set of all sets. Letting us ask a question that I see as a possible crack to a non-theological, non-metaphysical discourse that would be not, of course, that you are elevating your discourse to be a meta-language or whatever, this, this sort of Zizek scrap, but why are you even bothering? Why do we care? Why do we not not give a damn? Why should I take your discourse seriously? Why should I be interested to what you are saying, to your particular philosophical discourse? Levinas question would be <laughs> Levinas question would be what is the referent for that signifier that comes to mind as God? Shall we rephrase such paradoxical concern with the psychoanalytic Lacanian question, what do you want? And to conclude, perhaps this enigma connects to what we said about you said in the end about politics that there is no neutral stance that you can adopt in and about the political realm. Can there be, however, a, stra a stance, perhaps a Socratic one, which is the most concretely universal political intervention, a universal stance, let's say for the sake of the argument, the stance of thought, that is not, not discriminating, but that is also not, not partisan as if there were two armies always in battle against each other and which we call the good and the bad according to which one we belong to. It all goes back to the ethical question, I think. I'm impressed that you weren't listening to my talk, you were just writing that. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so let's break that down slightly. Um, what I didn't want to do is to imply that I'm uh, repressing uh, the reading of Nietzsche or the return of Nietzsche, for example, uh, that was going on. Um, I'm just talking about a very stupid account of post-structuralism where people got very excited about certain statements in Nietzsche and the fact that the human sciences weren't working out so well and they universalized them to all of the sciences and they started to believe that all, of the, all truths were metaphors in a stupid sense. But there is a sensible sense in which we can say all truths are metaphors, we can say, you know, in the early Lacanian system, all truth is based on the paternal metaphor, the original substitution of the name of the father for the desire of the mother, which opens up the possibility of truth. So there is an important relation between metaphor and truth, where metaphor underlies truth. Um, so all of that can be... Um, uh, uh, nothing is false about the story where Nietzsche is rediscovered. Um, and around this quote. It's not a simple lie, but it is that um, uh, it normally is sold as the idea that people suddenly read Nietzsche and they get really excited about the fact that they can reject reason and they can go off and they can be rebels and uh, there's a kind of theoretical an anarchy. It's not a theoretical anarchy, it's a realization that when you get to this kind of uh, post-structuralist position, um, uh, that you, 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 you appreciate uh, the imminence of metaphor in the production of truth. 
and you can start to map that and you can start to interrogate it. And these are um, issues that, the, the, for example, the Deleuze and Nietzsche as a, as a mapping of the underlying forces of the psyche would, would help us to, to think through. So yeah, like I said, it's not Nietzsche's not relevant, it's that Nietzsche offers answers within new questions that are opened up by a certain kind of collapse that takes place in the sciences, as opposed to um, there are the sciences, people read Nietzsche, and then they collapse the sciences on the basis of reading Nietzsche. So it's a simple point. Um, with regard to the, the theological, I think that um, you can certainly see the kind of thing we're doing here as, uh, you know, I mean, the fact is that these post-structuralist thoughts that started to emerge in the late 50s, early 60s, um, led in the 80s and 90s to a massive resurgence of you know, what we call post-secularism, to new ways of understanding God, new ways of relating to uh, religious experience and religious meaning, um, that felt like they were liberated from um, effectively a, a dumb idea of God, a dumb idea of God which was uh, the idea of God as the creator. So how, if we are locked within an imminent field of language, if there is no exception to language, how do we understand God? If we understand God on the basis of um, notions of the imaginary and real within uh, a system where there is no name of the Father, then potentially we can't have a more theologically interesting version of God than a God that um, delivers everything to us, um, a God that ensures uh, that uh, things are the way we take them to be, or one that offers a pure, true system if we take science far enough. So the death of God is not a rejection of God necessarily. I mean, what it's come to mean is uh, we need to find a new God. So, I mean, the most famous thinker of this is Mark C. Taylor. Uh, Mark C. Taylor said that um, uh, in, in, he produced a movement called Death of God Theology. Um, in Death of God Theology, a you know, nice absurd little term that, that, that he was using, um, uh, the problem is that Nietzsche only told us about the death of God. We need to also understand the death of the book uh, which Derrida helps us to understand, we need to understand the death of man, which Foucault helps us to understand. We need, we need to understand a various combination of deaths and how we can then reevaluate our place in existence, our place in what we can call creation, a creation without creation, a creation without the notion of a creator in, in, in that sense. So, but then that allows piercings of theology. And one of the best thinkers for that would, of course, be Levinas. And Levinas is not interested in God as a guy who made existence. Uh, has very little interest in that. His interest is, is uh, the encounter with the other person and how um, an overwhelming, infinite emotional response to the other's mortality is evidence of a beyond of being which is completely beyond temporal spatiality. The other, the holy other, is beyond temporal spatiality, it's beyond the constitution of the world that we produce in a phenomenological sense for Levinas. Um, it is in a, a past, an immemorial past, a past beyond the past, a past that was never present. Um, it's the creation of an enclave outside of existence, um, which, again, you could say is, is related to, I mean, he relates it to Plato's good beyond being, um, and how this has never been part of the order of being. Um, Levinas would hate the idea of a, a god who created things within the order of being in the sense of you know, scattering animals, naming them, etc., if we take that in a literal sense. Of course, he has an interest in uh, the book of Genesis and, so, and, and interpreting it in very different ways, but uh, it's not about a God who creates structures of difference. And the very opportunity for that, the very opportunity for a God who is beyond being, I think is, will, will be helped to think that by thinking in terms of this rather than in terms of the name of the Father. So that's a, a response to a few of the threads through what you said. <coughs> 